We've traveled to the far reaches of the cosmos, explored the deepest recesses of the human mind. But what about the mysterious depths of our own world's oceans? What lurks beneath the waves? And I'm not talking about sea monsters or lost cities, but submarines. When we think about the milestones in submarine technology, the USS Nautilus is at the top of the list. Named after the fictional submarine in Jules Verne's novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, this vessel pioneered an entirely new era in naval warfare. Commissioned in 1954, the Nautilus was the world's first operational nuclear-powered submarine, a groundbreaking feat of engineering. Before the Nautilus, submarines had to surface regularly for air to run their diesel engines. Nuclear power changed that, providing virtually unlimited underwater endurance and speed. This extraordinary capability dramatically altered the tactics of submarine warfare and significantly raised the strategic importance of these vessels. The Nautilus set many records, including the first submerged transit of the North Pole. The success of the USS Nautilus marked a shift from diesel-electric to nuclear submarines, which was quickly adopted by several other navies around the world. Following the Nautilus, the Soviets felt a pressing need to keep pace with their Cold War adversaries. In response, they developed the Alpha Class, a revolutionary leap in submarine technology. Launched in the 1960s, the Alpha Class submarines were the fastest and deepest diving military submarines ever built. The Alpha Class was equipped with a high-power liquid metal-cooled nuclear reactor providing a top speed of up to 41 knots, which is about 47 miles per hour, a speed that remains unparalleled by any other military submarine. These submarines had a stronger titanium pressure hull, allowing them to dive to extreme depths far beyond the capabilities of most Western submarines. The Alpha Class submarines were built to be hunter killers, designed to chase down and destroy enemy submarines and ships. Despite their technological superiority, only seven were built, due to their high operational costs and the complexity of their maintenance. The USS Nautilus and the Alpha Class marked significant advancements in submarine technology, both in terms of speed, stealth and the ability to stay submerged for longer periods. These developments significantly escalated the stealthy warfare of the deep seas, raising the stakes for navies around the globe. Dialing back the clock, let's go to where it all started with the Holland One. Named after its creator, Irish engineer John Philip Holland, this was the first submarine commissioned by the United States Navy and the first to be officially used in combat. It was a revolution for its time and every modern submarine can trace its lineage back to the Holland One. Completed in 1897, the Holland One was an experimental vessel, only 53 feet in length. It could carry a crew of six and was armed with a single torpedo tube. Its combination of electric and gasoline engines made it the first truly practical submarine, capable of operating both on the surface and underwater. Despite its limited range and operational depth, the Holland One laid the foundation for submarine warfare, giving birth to a new type of vessel that would change naval warfare forever. From the humble beginnings of the Holland One, we move to the colossus of submarine design, the Typhoon class. Built by the Soviets during the Cold War, the Typhoon class submarines are the largest submarines ever built, measuring a staggering 175 meters in length, almost twice as long as a football field. Their size is not just for show, these Titans could carry 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles, each with up to 10 independent nuclear warheads. Additionally, they boasted multiple pressure hulls, which improved their survivability and even included creature comforts unheard of in other submarines, such as a swimming pool and a sauna. Designed for long missions, these behemoths could remain submerged for months at a time. The leap from the Holland One to the Typhoon class demonstrates the remarkable evolution of submarines from rudimentary underwater vessels to floating fortresses capable of global nuclear deterrence. Despite their differences in size and capabilities, each submarine holds a unique place in the history of naval warfare. Their tales are a testament to human ingenuity and the pursuit of technological dominance under the waves. Let's move across the Atlantic to the United States and the Seawolf class. The USS Seawolf, SSN-21, was envisioned as the most technologically advanced hunter-killer submarine of its era. Commissioned in 1997, at the end of the Cold War, 
it was designed to hunt and destroy the most advanced Soviet submarines and surface ships. The Seawolf features a unique hydrodynamically optimized hull built to minimize noise and maximize speed. Powered by a nuclear reactor, it can reach depths greater than 800 feet and speeds up to 35 knots. Its advanced sonar systems and Mark 48 torpedoes make it a formidable hunter, ready to take on any threat that lurks beneath the waves. Sailing over to the British Isles, we encounter the Astute class. As the Royal Navy's latest series of nuclear-powered submarines, the Astute class is recognized as the most advanced submarine Britain has ever sent to sea. Notable for its stealth characteristics, the Astute class is often referred to as the silent predator of the seas. The Astute class submarines are powered by a nuclear reactor that can operate for 25 years without refueling. These state-of-the-art vessels are armed with Tomahawk cruise missiles and spearfish torpedoes, giving them formidable striking power. With the ability to operate covertly across the world's oceans, the Astute class submarines are a testament to the UK's submarine design prowess and offer a striking example of modern undersea warfare capabilities. E on to the latest American technological marvel, the Virginia class. In the face of evolving global security challenges, the United States Navy needed a flexible multi-mission platform. The answer? The Virginia-class submarines, renowned for their cutting-edge technology and versatility, they truly set the modern standard. These submarines are nuclear-powered and capable of a vast range of missions, from anti-submarine and anti-surface ship warfare to surveillance. Virginia-class submarines come with an advanced sonar system that offers superior detection capabilities. Each of them can reach speeds over 25 knots and dive beyond 800 feet. Their design and stealth capabilities ensure they remain undetectable to adversaries, allowing them to strike at a moment's notice. Now let's take a deep dive into the Arctic waters with the Russian Oscar II class. These are some of the largest submarines ever built, designed primarily to destroy American aircraft carriers and their battle groups. Their size alone is enough to cause a second look. But it's not just about size. The Oscar II class, also known as Project 949A Anti, is packed with lethal weaponry. It's armed with 24 P-700 granite, SSN-19 shipwreck, anti-ship cruise missiles. Each of them carrying a massive payload, they can dive up to 600 meters, making them one of the deepest diving military submarines. With a speed of up to 32 knots, these underwater cruisers present a significant threat to any potential adversaries. Turning our attention to the powerhouse of submarine exports, we have the German Type 214. They are built by Hovaltswerke Deutsche Werft, which has a history dating back to 1838. Its focus on diesel-electric submarines led to the development of the Type 214, a submarine that's seen as a quiet yet lethal underwater operator. The Type 214 submarines are known for their advanced fuel cell-based air-independent propulsion system, enabling them to remain underwater for longer periods without the need to surface frequently. They also boast an impressive array of torpedoes and can carry harpoon anti-ship missiles. With a hull design that reduces sound emission and absorption, these submarines are some of the stealthiest vessels on the high seas. The submarine has been widely exported to many countries, testifying to its overall quality and performance. Last, but certainly not least, we arrive at the Russian beast, the Yasin class. Officially designated as the Project 885, these submarines represent the pinnacle of Russian undersea technology, designed to hunt down and destroy enemy submarines and surface vessels. The Yasin class are nuclear-powered attack submarines, and they're armed to the teeth. Along with torpedo tubes, they carry Onyx and Kaliber cruise missiles, providing a wide range of attack options. They have the capacity to reach depths of up to 600 meters and can reach a speed of over 30 knots. Thanks to its unique spherical sonar system, the Yasin class enjoys unparalleled detection capabilities, making them one of the most formidable submarines in the world. In terms of technology, power and capabilities, these 10 submarines have set and continue to push the boundaries of undersea warfare. From the birth of submarine technology with the Holland One to the modern giants of the seas, like the Yasin class, each has its unique place and influence on history. As we look to the future, it's fascinating to imagine what the next generation of submarines will bring. The mysteries of the deep continue to challenge our technology and our courage 
and these submarines remind us of just how far we've come and yet how much more there is to explore. Today we're embarking on a fantastic voyage across the world's oceans, not in a tiny ship but aboard the greatest naval marvels of our time. From the hulking aircraft carriers of the United States to the powerful destroyers of Russia, these ships aren't just feats of engineering, they're floating cities armed to the teeth with some of the most advanced technology known to man. Their sheer size and power are a testament to human ingenuity and the strategic importance of naval dominance, so buckle up as we set sail and discover the top 10 most advanced Navy battleships. The USS Gerald R. Ford, or CVN-78, is not just a marvel of modern engineering, but it also represents the future of naval power projection. Named after the 38th President of the United States, this aircraft carrier is the lead ship of her class and the first new US aircraft carrier design in over 40 years. The ship itself is a staggering 1,092 feet in length. That's about the size of three football fields. But it's not just the size that's impressive. The USS Gerald R. Ford introduces a variety of technological enhancements over the older Nimitz-class carriers. The most significant is the Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System, or EMAILS. This replaces the old steam catapults, providing a more efficient, smoother and more adjustable launch of aircraft, improving the rate of launches and reducing wear and tear on the aircraft. Further, the ship incorporates new nuclear reactors that produce 250% more electrical power than their predecessors, which means it has the capacity to incorporate future systems like laser weapons, the Ford-class carriers also feature a new, smaller, faster reacting radar system, an advanced arresting gear for landing aircraft, and a design that requires significantly fewer crew members. HMS Queen Elizabeth is not just a ship, but a statement of intent and a symbol of national ambition. It's the lead ship of the Queen Elizabeth class of aircraft carriers, the largest warships ever built for the Royal Navy of the United Kingdom, and the embodiment of a nation's naval heritage. At 932 feet in length and a displacement of 65,000 tons, the HMS Queen Elizabeth dwarfs all other warships in the Royal Navy's fleet. But again, it's not just the size that matters. The ship incorporates innovative technology, such as the ski jump ramp at the end of the runway that helps increase the payload or range of the aircraft being launched. Moreover, the ship is designed for a versatile range of operations, from humanitarian and disaster relief to fighting the wars of the future. It can accommodate up to 40 aircraft and is equipped with the highly advanced F-35B Lightning II stealth fighters and Merlin helicopters for airborne early warning and anti-submarine warfare. Perhaps most impressive is the ship's level of automation, which allows it to operate with a crew of only about 700 sailors, significantly fewer than comparable carriers in other navies. Its two gas turbine engines and four diesel engines can propel the ship at speeds in excess of 25 knots, all while carrying enough food and supplies to operate for up to seven months at sea without resupply. The INS Vikramaditya is not only a symbol of pride for the Indian Navy, but it's also a testament to the power of engineering and technological innovation. This aircraft carrier, once the Russian ship Admiral Gorshkov, underwent an extensive and complicated refurbishment to be transformed into the flagship of the Indian Navy. At a length of 930 feet and displacement of 45,400 tons, INS Vikramaditya is smaller than the USS Gerald R. Ford and the HMS Queen Elizabeth, but it's a crucial component of the Indian Navy's blue water capabilities. The ship has the capacity to carry over 30 aircraft, including the MiG-29K fighter jet and various types of helicopters. The carrier is also equipped with advanced sensors, including the long-range air surveillance radars and advanced electronic warfare suites that can detect and track incoming threats. Furthermore, the ship is powered by eight new generation boilers, which makes it capable of reaching speeds of over 30 knots. When we talk about the most advanced Navy ships, we cannot ignore the Aegis destroyers, known for their high-tech combat system. Named after Aegis, the shield of the Greek god Zeus, these ships provide the backbone of modern naval defense for several nations, including the United States, Japan, South Korea, and Spain. The Aegis combat system, from which the ships get their name, is a centralized, automated command and control weapons control system that uses powerful computers and radars to track and guide weapons to destroy enemy targets. 
The system's SBI-1 radar is amongst the most advanced and powerful naval radars in the world, capable of performing search, track and missile guidance functions simultaneously, with a track capacity of over 100 targets. These destroyers are armed with a range of weapons, including anti-air, anti-surface and anti-submarine warfare systems. They also have the capability to engage ballistic missiles, enhancing their role in defense. The American Arleigh Burke class, the Japanese Atago class and the South Korean Sejong the Great class are among the most well-known Aegis destroyers. These are not just ships, they are a comprehensive and highly adaptable combat system, capable of dealing with multiple simultaneous threats in all warfare areas. They are the true watchful eyes of the sea, always vigilant against potential threats. The Zumwalt class destroyers represent the next generation of naval warfare. These US Navy vessels incorporate the latest technology to redefine what a destroyer is capable of. It's not just about size or firepower, it's about utilizing cutting-edge tech to create a truly futuristic vessel. The stealth capabilities of the Zumwalt class are unprecedented. Its unique tumble-home hull design, where the hull slopes inward above the waterline, reduces its radar cross-section, making it harder to detect. Add to that the advanced multifunction radar system, and it's clear that this vessel is built for stealth. However, stealth doesn't mean it's lacking in firepower. On board is the advanced gun system, which can launch rocket-assisted, precision-guided projectiles up to 63 nautical miles. Future plans include installing electromagnetic railguns, weapons that use magnetic fields rather than explosives, to launch projectiles at high speeds. The Zumwalt class also boasts integrated power systems that provide electricity to all the ship's systems, making it possible to incorporate advanced weapons and sensors. The Admiral Gorshkov class, or Project 2, 2350, is Russia's latest and most advanced class of frigates, symbolizing the renaissance of the Russian Navy's surface combatant fleet. The frigate represents a balanced naval platform, smaller than a destroyer but larger than a corvette, providing both offensive and defensive capabilities. Despite being classified as a frigate, the Admiral Gorshkov class is armed to the teeth. The ship carries the potent P-800 Onyx and Kaliber cruise missiles, known for their range and precision. These can be used against naval or land targets, giving the Admiral Gorshkov class a long reach. Additionally, the ship has advanced air defense systems, including the Polymant Redute system, similar to the Aegis system. The Redoubt system can track and engage multiple aerial targets simultaneously, from aircraft to cruise and ballistic missiles. The Admiral Gorshkov class is designed to be stealthy, with a reduced radar cross-section and thermal signature. In addition, the ship is equipped with advanced electronic warfare systems and decoys to confuse enemy radars and missiles. China's Type 055 destroyer, also known as the Renhai class, represents the latest leap in the People's Liberation Army Navy's technological development. This class of guided missile destroyers is one of the largest and most powerful surface combatants currently in operation in the world. The Renhai class has a displacement of about 13,000 tons and spans an impressive 180 meters in length. This massive vessel can sustain high-speed operations across vast distances, serving China's strategic ambitions across the Asia-Pacific region. In terms of weaponry, the Renhai class is armed with a potent mix of anti-air, anti-ship and anti-submarine missiles. The most noteworthy is the YJ-18 anti-ship cruise missile, known for its supersonic terminal speed, making it challenging for enemy defenses to intercept. Beyond its impressive arsenal, the Renhai class features cutting-edge radar systems that can detect and track multiple targets concurrently, from aircraft to missile threats. These destroyers can function as a fleet's protective shield while also packing a substantial offensive punch. The FREM, Frigate European Multi-Mission class, represents a joint venture between France and Italy to develop a new class of frigates that can handle a variety of tasks from anti-aircraft warfare to anti-submarine operations. This European project is a clear demonstration of the benefits of cooperative efforts in defense. It reflects the shared vision, standards, and technological capabilities of two of Europe's biggest naval powers. In terms of weaponry, the Fremem frigates come equipped with an array of missile systems for a variety of tasks. This includes Aster surface-to-air missiles and Exocet anti-ship missiles. 
Italian variants also feature the Tessio MK2-E, an anti-ship and land attack missile. Frem frigates also incorporate advanced sensor suites, including a state-of-the-art radar system capable of detecting and tracking multiple targets. This allows the frigate to respond effectively to threats in real time. These vessels are also equipped for anti-submarine warfare, featuring low-frequency towed sonar arrays and MU-90 torpedoes. It's these capabilities that make the Frem a truly multi-mission frigate, capable of dealing with a broad range of threats and tasks. Japan's Izumo-class helicopter destroyers are a class of ships that blur the line between destroyer and aircraft carrier. They represent Japan's largest warships since World War II. Though they are officially classified as helicopter destroyers, their flat-deck design and large displacement, 27,000 tons, give them the appearance of miniature aircraft carriers. The Izumo-class ships are 248 meters long and carry up to 14 helicopters. They have been designed for anti-submarine warfare and can quickly deploy helicopters to track and neutralize submarine threats. The ships also have the capacity to support amphibious operations, humanitarian aid, and disaster relief missions. The Izumo's primary armament is its squadron of SH-60K anti-submarine helicopters. They also carry anti-surface and anti-aircraft weapons for self-defense, including the Phalanx Close-In Weapon System CIWS, and the CRAM Missile System. What makes Izumo unique, however, is that it could potentially operate short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft. Although Japan's constitution prohibits offensive military capability, the potential capability of Izumo to operate such aircraft is significant. The USS Missouri, affectionately known as the Mighty Mo, is an Iowa-class battleship that served in the United States Navy from World War II through the Gulf War. It was the site of the surrender of the Empire of Japan, marking the end of World War II. At the time of its construction, the USS Missouri was a marvel of technology. It had a displacement of over 45,000 tons and measured over 270 meters in length. This vessel was equipped with nine 16-inch guns, each capable of launching a projectile over 20 miles. For defense against air attack, the Missouri was originally equipped with dozens of anti-aircraft guns. These were later supplemented and then replaced with missile systems as technology progressed. Despite having been decommissioned in 1992, the USS Missouri remains a symbol of American naval power. It now serves as a museum ship at Pearl Harbor, allowing visitors to step back in time and experience a piece of naval history. Its advanced design for the time, combined with the critical role it played in historic events, earns the USS Missouri a place in our list. Have you ever marveled at the sheer size and complexity of an aircraft carrier? These floating cities, home to thousands of sailors, are among the most powerful and technologically advanced vessels ever built. Today, we're diving into a journey across the waves and through time to discover the top 10 most advanced and largest aircraft carriers that have ever sailed the seas. From the pioneering design of the HMS Hermes to the unmanned carriers of the future, these seafaring leviathans are sure to astound you with their massive scale technological marvels and the impact they've had on the course of naval warfare. What if I told you that the first purpose-built aircraft carrier was commissioned almost a century ago? That's right, the HMS Hermes, a British ship, was the world's first ship to be designed and built as an aircraft carrier from the keel up. She was commissioned in 1924, a time when naval aviation was in its infancy. Equipped with a full-length flight deck, an island superstructure, a hangar and lifts, the Hermes established the basic format that aircraft carriers follow to this day. Despite her small size compared to modern giants, she played a crucial role in World War II before being sunk by Japanese aircraft in 1942. The HMS Hermes may not match up to today's standards, but she was undoubtedly a groundbreaker in her time. Fast forward to the 1960s and we enter the nuclear age with the USS Enterprise, CVN-65, the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. The Big E, as she was affectionately known, was not just remarkable for her propulsion system, but she was also the longest naval vessel ever built at the time. With eight nuclear reactors powering her, the Enterprise could reach speeds exceeding 33 knots, 38 miles per hour, 61 kilometers per age, and operate for years without refueling. 
This was a paradigm shift in naval operations, allowing the Enterprise to remain at sea for extended periods without the need for frequent refueling stops. She also had an impressive air wing, capable of carrying over 90 aircraft. Serving for more than 50 years, the Enterprise left a significant impact on naval history, setting the standard for future aircraft carriers with her innovative nuclear power and immense capabilities. But moving towards the east, let's discuss INS Vikramaditya, the pride of the Indian Navy. This ship was originally the Russian Admiral Gorshkov before being extensively refurbished and sold to India. Now what makes the Vikramaditya special? With a length of 930 feet, 283.5 meters, and a displacement of 45,000 tons, it's smaller than some of its American counterparts but still packs a punch. Its air wing consists of MiG-29K multi-role fighters and Kamovka 31 AEW and C helicopters, providing a formidable aerial defense. The Vikramaditya doesn't possess the catapult systems found on many Western carriers. Instead, it uses a stowbar, short takeoff but arrested recovery system. This makes operations different and interesting. It's a floating airfield that bolsters India's blue water capabilities. And speaking of Russia, it brings us to the Admiral Kuznetsov, Russia's only operational aircraft carrier, and one with a distinct character. This carrier, commissioned in 1990, has a unique design compared to Western carriers. The Kuznetsov is actually classified by Russia as a heavy aircraft carrying cruiser, reflecting its unusual mix of air power and ship-borne weapons. It has a displacement of about 55,000 tons and, like the Vikramaditya, uses a stowbar system for aircraft operations. But here's the kicker. The Kuznetsov also carries powerful anti-ship and anti-submarine missiles, a feature not seen on most dedicated aircraft carriers. This combination of air power and direct fire capability makes it a distinct vessel in the world of aircraft carriers. As they say, it's not just the size, but also the firepower that counts. But now let's turn our attention to the Charles de Gaulle, France's only aircraft carrier and the only non-American nuclear-powered carrier currently in service. So what sets this French naval marvel apart? With a displacement of 42,500 tons and a length of 858 feet, 261.5 meters, it is smaller than some of its contemporaries, but its nuclear power gives it the ability to stay at sea for prolonged periods without refueling. Moreover, it is equipped with the Catabar, Catapult Assisted Takeoff Barrier Arrested Recovery System, that allows it to operate a diverse air wing, including the Rafale Multi Role Fighter and the E 2C Hawkeye AEW aircraft. Additionally, the Charles de Gaulle's nuclear power allows it to steam at high speed vital for generating wind over the deck for aircraft operations. It's Europe's only nuclear-powered flattop and a symbol of French blue water capability. Now, let's journey back across the Atlantic to discuss the USS Gerald R. Ford, a marvel of modern naval engineering and the lead ship of her class. With a whopping 100 ton displacement and a length of 1,106 feet, 337.3 meters, the Ford is the largest and most advanced aircraft carrier in the world. What makes her unique, you ask? Well, the Ford introduces a host of new technologies, such as the electromagnetic aircraft launch system, EMAILS, which uses magnetic fields to launch aircraft, a technological leap from the steam catapults of old. Moreover, the advanced arresting gear, AAG system, offers more efficient and reliable recovery of aircraft. Plus, the new nuclear reactors on the Ford class provide more power, yet require fewer crew members to operate, improving efficiency and capacity for future technologies. The USS Gerald R. Ford isn't just an aircraft carrier, it's a glimpse into the future of naval aviation. As we shift our focus towards Asia, we find China's first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning. Now, what's interesting about the Liaoning is that it was originally a Soviet vessel called the Varyag, left unfinished due to the collapse of the Soviet Union. China acquired the vessel in 1998 under the guise of turning it into a floating casino. However, the ship underwent extensive renovations and was commissioned as an aircraft carrier in 2012. With a displacement of around 60,000 tons and a length of 999 feet, 304.5 meters, 
The Liaoning serves as the flagship of the rapidly growing Chinese Navy. Equipped with a ski jump style deck for aircraft takeoff, it can accommodate J 15 fighter jets and a variety of helicopters. Although not as technologically advanced as some other carriers on this list, the Liaoning is a symbol of China's naval ambitions and their remarkable journey from a coastal defense force to a budding blue water navy. Next, let's explore the HMS Queen Elizabeth, the largest warship ever built for the Royal Navy. Boasting a displacement of 65,000 tons and a length of 932 feet, 284 meters, this mammoth vessel represents the United Kingdom's return to the rank of nations operating large aircraft carriers, what sets the HMS Queen Elizabeth apart. Firstly, it uses a unique twin island design, separating the ship's running from the flying control, providing increased operational efficiency. Additionally, it employs a ski jump takeoff ramp, similar to the Liaoning, to operate the advanced F 35B Lightning II Joint Strike Fighters. With a highly automated design that requires a crew of only around 700 sailors, nearly half the crew needed on a Nimitz class carrier, the HMS Queen Elizabeth exemplifies a new era of British naval power and the potency of the Royal Navy on the high seas. And how can we forget the USS Nimitz, the lead ship of her class and a vessel that has long been the benchmark for aircraft carriers worldwide? Launched in 1972, the Nimitz with its sister ships embodies the might of the US Navy. An imposing sight, the Nimitz stretches over 1,092 feet, 332.8 meters, boasting a whopping displacement of over 100,000 tons. It's equipped with a nuclear power plant, allowing it to operate for over 20 years without refueling. It's an absolute marvel of engineering that carries a formidable air wing of about 90 aircraft, including the advanced FA-18 Super Hornet multi-role fighters. With four steam catapults, it can launch aircraft at an impressive pace, maintaining a high operational tempo. Its cutting-edge Aegis combat system and robust anti-aircraft defenses render it a virtually impregnable floating fortress. But what does the future hold? Imagine a carrier roaming the high seas, launching and recovering aircraft, all while not a single human steps foot aboard. Sounds like science fiction, right? Well, not exactly. The idea of unmanned carriers is becoming a serious consideration in naval circles. While the technology is still under development, it's likely that future carriers could be smaller, cheaper, and thanks to advancements in drone technology, able to operate with fewer risks to human life. Imagine swarms of unmanned combat air vehicles, UKAVs, executing coordinated strikes, surveillance and reconnaissance missions. It's a transformation that could redefine naval warfare as we know it. As automation and AI continue to evolve, the concept of the ghost fleet, once a thing of fiction, edges ever closer to reality. Now imagine, if the world were to suddenly plunge into a catastrophic event, where would you go? Where could you find shelter that offers not just protection, but the ability to survive for an extended period of time? Well, around the world, there are special structures designed for exactly this scenario. These are the doomsday bunkers, fortresses designed to withstand calamities that could potentially wipe out most life on the surface of the Earth. From the chilly shores of Svalbard to the opulence of the Czech Republic's Oppidum, let's explore 10 of the most fascinating doomsday bunkers around the globe. Let's begin our subterranean journey in Corsham, Wiltshire, UK, where the Burlington Bunker, also known as Site 3, resides. This underground city is a marvel of Cold War era engineering. Built in the 1950s, when the threat of nuclear war loomed large, the bunker was intended to be a refuge for the UK government to continue operations in the event of a nuclear disaster. Its scale is almost hard to comprehend. The site spans over 35 acres, carved into a former bath stone quarry, and is estimated to have over 60 miles of roads, complete with traffic lights. It was designed to house up to 4,000 government officials and staff and was fully equipped for long-term living. There were dormitories, offices, kitchens, a water treatment facility, and even a hospital with an operating theatre. Perhaps the most intriguing feature of the Burlington Bunker was the BBC Broadcasting Studio, equipped to transmit a message from the Prime Minister to the survivors of a nuclear attack. This city beneath the city stands as a testament to the lengths humanity will go to ensure its survival. If we travel to the remote Arctic Svalbard archipelago in Norway, we'll find a bunker with a different mission. Not to protect humans, but to protect something just as crucial. Seeds. 
The Svalbard Global Seed Vault, sometimes called the Doomsday Vault, is designed to safeguard the seeds of the world's food plants in the event of a global crisis. The vault is buried in a mountain on the island of Spitsbergen, around 800 miles from the North Pole, and was constructed to be resistant to all manner of global disasters, including nuclear war. Its remote location and permafrost keep the seeds naturally frozen, reducing reliance on mechanical cooling systems. Inside, the vault can store up to 4.5 million different seed samples. As of now, it houses nearly a million, representing hundreds of thousands of plant species. In a way, the Svalbard Seed Vault is like the insurance policy for our planet's food supply, providing a fail-safe, secure seed storage facility for the biodiversity that future generations will rely on for sustenance. Moving on, our journey takes us to West Virginia in the United States. Nestled beneath the lavish Greenbrier Resort, a historic hotel dating back to 1778, lies a relic of the Cold War era, the Greenbrier Bunker. The bunker was constructed in the late 1950s and early 60s under the codename Project Greek Island. Its existence was one of the US government's best-kept secrets for three decades. The bunker was designed to hold the entire United States Congress, both the House of Representatives and the Senate, in the event of a nuclear war. Covering an area of over 112,000 square feet, the bunker includes dormitories, a cafeteria, a hospital, meeting rooms for the House and Senate, and a broadcast center from which the President could address the nation. It was maintained in a constant state of readiness by an on-site team until its existence was revealed in a 1992 Washington Post article. The next stop on our journey is in the quiet village of Carp, Ontario, Canada. Here lies an ominous four-story, 100,000-square-foot underground bunker aptly named the Diefenbunker, after Canada's 13th Prime Minister, John Diefenbarker. Built during the Cold War, between 1959 and 1961, the Diefenbunker was designed to withstand a 5-megaton nuclear blast from 1.8 kilometers away. Inside, the bunker's layout is a veritable labyrinth designed to house 535 government officials and military officers for up to a month. It features living quarters, a large cafeteria, a hospital, and even a CBC radio studio. The bunker was decommissioned in the 1990s and now serves as Canada's Cold War Museum, offering a stark reminder of the anxieties and fears of the not-too-distant past. What's more, it's the only known Canadian doomsday bunker that was built to house Canadian officials in the event of a nuclear war. It stands as a testament to the once tangible fear of nuclear annihilation that pervaded the globe during the Cold War. Vivos, Indiana in the United States is our next stop. Built during the height of the Cold War in 1961, this one-time AT&T relay station is the epitome of 21 st century doomsday preparation. It was acquired by the Vivos Group, a company specializing in building and maintaining private and community survival shelters, Covering a massive 80,000 square feet, this bunker is hidden beneath a sprawling, nondescript, security-fenced surface compound. It boasts of its own medical and dental facilities, fully equipped gym, pet kennels, a shop, and even a prison cell to handle unruly occupants. With 12 and a half foot high ceilings and its own self-contained water and power generation system, this bunker can comfortably accommodate up to 80 people for one year without needing any supplies from the surface. Shifting our gaze to Europe, we find ourselves in the Adam Ondras Bunker in the Czech Republic. Named after the nearby hill, the Adam Ondras Bunker is a relic from the era of the Iron Curtain. The bunker was built during the 1950s and its primary function was to serve as a communications center for the Czechoslovak army. But the fortified bunker was also designed to protect against a nuclear attack. With a floor area of over 2,000 square meters spread across several levels, it could hold hundreds of military personnel and civilians. Unlike some of the other bunkers on our list, this one hasn't been converted into a hotel or sold to private companies. Instead, it remains a chilling monument to the Cold War era. The bunker is now open to the public as a museum and serves as a stark reminder of a time when the threat of nuclear war loomed large over the world. From the outskirts of the Czech Republic, we return to the United States, Kansas to be precise. Here lies one of the most luxurious doomsday bunkers imaginable, the Survival Condo. This isn't your average bunker. It's a converted Atlas missile silo, a missile launch complex built during the Cold War era, 
to house and launch the Atlas Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. After being decommissioned, the silo was purchased and transformed into an opulent survival shelter by Larry Hall, a real estate developer. The survival condo spans 15 floors, with seven of them dedicated to private residences. These full-floor units can house six to ten people and include all the amenities of a modern home, including high-end appliances, home automation, and even pet parks for the furry family members. The complex is self-sustaining, with facilities for food production, water purification, and air filtration, among others. In addition to these, it boasts a swimming pool, gym, cinema, and even a school. The survival condo is prepared for any disaster, from nuclear war and pandemics to solar flares and civil unrest. Moving over to the mountains of North Carolina, we encounter an entirely different type of survival shelter. The Doomsday Castle, as it's aptly named, was made famous by the National Geographic reality show of the same name. Built by Brent Sr., a retired army officer and his family, the Doomsday Castle is a unique blend of medieval architecture and modern survival engineering. It's constructed atop a mountain and incorporates an array of defenses, including a drawbridge, portcullis and thick stone walls. The castle is designed to withstand disasters such as hurricanes, riots and EMP attacks. Inside, the castle contains various survival amenities like a rainwater collection system, solar panels for electricity, and a smokehouse for preserving food. The structure itself is designed to be sustainable in the long term, utilizing resources available on site, such as a quarry for stones and a forest for wood. The Doomsday Castle is a testament to the family's dedication to self-reliance and preparedness, illustrating the length some are willing to go to ensure their survival. Shifting back to Europe, we land in the Czech Republic, home to one of the largest and most exclusive private bunkers in the world, the Opadum. This extraordinary facility stretches over 323,000 square feet, with a two-level underground component and a residential estate above ground. Initially constructed in the Cold War era, the bunker was designed to withstand nuclear and chemical warfare. Its above-ground mansion is luxurious, complete with a beautiful park, a swimming pool, and even a helipad. However, the real marvel lies below the surface. Underneath the estate is an expansive bunker featuring a plethora of amenities. These include a conference room, a surgical facility, a private vault, and even a wine cellar. The Oppidum even has a plan for long-term underground living, featuring its private collection of survival gear and sophisticated life support systems. It offers the potential to live lavishly while simultaneously being ready for any catastrophe that may strike. Our final stop takes us back to the USA, in Montebello, California to be precise. Here, the Atlas Survival Shelters Company produces some of the most innovative and accessible personal bunkers on the market. These shelters are designed with practicality and durability in mind. Made from galvanized corrugated pipe, they can be buried up to 42 feet underground, offering excellent protection from nuclear, biological and chemical threats. They come in various sizes, from small units for individuals to larger ones for families, capable of housing multiple people for an extended duration. The interiors of these bunkers are meticulously designed to provide a home-like atmosphere. They include sleeping quarters, kitchens, living areas and even storage spaces. In addition to the standard features, customers can customize their bunker with options such as a decontamination room, an escape hatch, or even a gun vault. With Atlas Survival Shelters, preparedness for the unknown is more attainable than ever. And as always, thanks for watching. It's intriguing, isn't it? Each of these doomsday bunkers provides a unique take on survival, blending practicality, luxury, and at times a bit of eccentricity. These places were designed to protect against the worst imaginable scenarios, and while they may represent fear of the unknown, they also symbolize human resilience, ingenuity, and our relentless pursuit to endure against all odds. Bunkers, airports, and secret societies, they might seem unrelated, but what if I told you they're at the heart of one of the most intriguing conspiracy theories around? Imagine an elaborate bunker hidden beneath the elegant facade of a luxury resort, and an airport said to house secrets as deep as its runways. Today, we're diving into the mysterious world of the Greenbrier Hotel and the Denver International Airport, two locations seemingly worlds apart, yet intertwined in a web of speculation and coincidences. So, 
Buckle up as we take an unprecedented flight into the unknown. The Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia is not your average resort. This grand establishment has a history as rich and varied as the mineral springs that first brought visitors to the area in the 18th century. Constructed in 1778 as a simple guest house, the Greenbrier grew over the centuries into a sprawling 710-room hotel surrounded by a stunning 11,000-acre estate, complete with golf courses, spa facilities and fine dining. But beneath this facade of luxury and leisure hides a much more fascinating history. During the Cold War era, as the threat of nuclear warfare loomed, the United States government began secretly constructing a massive underground bunker beneath the Greenbrier, codenamed Project Greek Island. This subterranean structure was designed to serve as an emergency shelter for the United States Congress in the event of a nuclear war. The existence of the bunker was one of the best kept secrets of the Cold War. For over 30 years, it remained fully operational and prepared for use, even as guests above remained blissfully unaware of the government's clandestine contingency plan beneath their feet. It was only in 1992, long after the end of the Cold War, that the bunker's existence was revealed to the public in a Washington Post expose. Today, the Greenbrier's unusual history and its unique blend of opulence and secrecy have made it a fascinating destination for tourists and history buffs alike. The bunker has been transformed into a tourist attraction, where visitors can take guided tours and learn about this remarkable and somewhat eerie chapter in the history of American government preparedness. Denver International Airport, DIA, nestled in the heart of the Rocky Mountains, holds its own aura of mystery. Since its opening in 1995, the airport has become a nexus of conspiracy theories and speculation, largely due to its peculiar art, large size and unexplained cost overruns. The airport covers an enormous area, 53 square miles to be precise, making it the largest airport in North America and the second largest in the world. Yet this sheer size raised eyebrows, with skeptics questioning the necessity for such a large airport. Why does a city like Denver need an airport bigger than Manhattan? The controversy deepened with the peculiar and arguably disturbing artwork scattered around the airport. Murals by artist Leo Tanguma, which depict war, environmental degradation and humanity's rebirth, have fed into apocalyptic theories. Then there's the 32-foot tall horse sculpture with glowing red eyes, nicknamed Blucifer, which is alleged to represent one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The piece de resistance of DIA's conspiracy law is the rumors of secret underground bunkers. Some believe these spaces were designed to serve as a fallout shelter for the world's elite in case of a global catastrophe, or perhaps as a headquarters for the New World Order. These theories were amplified by the fact that the airport's construction went $2 billion over budget and a cost overrun some theorize could only be explained by secret underground construction. Despite these theories being largely debunked, the rumors persist. In fact, DIA has embraced its status as a conspiracy hub, incorporating tongue-in-cheek references to these theories in its marketing and decor. So while it might just be an airport to some, to others, Denver International Airport is a symbol of intrigue, secrecy, and a portal to the unknown. The Greenbrier Hotel and the Denver International Airport on the surface could not be more different. One a luxurious historic resort nestled in the Allegheny Mountains, the other an expansive modern airport in the heart of the Rockies. Yet both share a common thread of intrigue, secrecy, and widespread speculation about their supposed roles in governmental conspiracies. The Green Briar Hotel, with its picturesque golf courses and sumptuous interiors, hid a secret for over three decades. A sprawling bunker, designed to house Congress in the event of nuclear war, lay concealed beneath its grounds. The bunker's existence, known only to a select few, was finally unveiled in 1992, revealing a reality more strange than fiction. Similarly, Denver International Airport, with its sprawling land area, otherworldly art and rumored underground tunnels, has become a hotbed of conspiracy theories. From murals depicting post-apocalyptic scenes to a colossal horse statue with fiery red eyes, the airport is teeming with elements that inspire both curiosity and fear. The alleged existence of vast underground bunkers and tunnels, despite being officially debunked, continues to capture the public's imagination. Comparing these two locations, it's fascinating to note the overlap in their timelines. 
The Greenbrier's bunker, though built during the height of the Cold War, was only officially acknowledged in 1992. Interestingly, this coincides with the early planning and construction phases of the Denver International Airport, which opened in 1995. This temporal proximity has led some conspiracy theorists to suggest that the reveal of the Greenbrier bunker was a distraction from the construction of a similar, but far larger and more sophisticated, complex beneath the Denver International Airport. While there's no substantial evidence to support this claim, it does add an extra layer of intrigue to the narrative surrounding these two iconic American landmarks. Now here's a little wrinkle in the story that makes the whole scenario a bit more intriguing. The year 1995 marked the completion of the Denver International Airport. The same year, the classified congressional bunker at the Greenbrier Hotel was exposed and decommissioned. Now isn't that a coincidence? One secret government project ends just as another potentially suspicious facility opens. Now it's important to note that the disclosure of the Greenbrier bunker was initiated by an investigative report from the Washington Post, and not an intentional government announcement. But still, the synchronicity of these two events has fueled speculations and given conspiracy theorists another layer to their theories. Let's venture deeper into some intriguing coincidences and lesser-known facts about the Greenbrier Hotel and Denver International Airport. These places are not just linked by conspiracy theories, but also have unexpected connections that further fuel the imaginative speculation. Firstly, the timing of the revelation about the Greenbrier's bunker and the completion of Denver International Airport. The bunker at the Greenbrier was exposed in 1992, the same year that construction on Denver International Airport began. While this could be purely coincidental, the temporal link has not gone unnoticed by those inclined towards conspiratorial thinking. Additionally, both locations have ties to the Freemasons, a fraternal organization often associated with secret societies and conspiracy theories. The dedication stone of Denver International Airport contains a Masonic symbol, and the time capsule beneath it is addressed to the people of Colorado in 2094 inches from the New World Airport Commission, a group that apparently never existed. For the Greenbrier Hotel, its designer, Dorothy Draper, was known for her distinctive style using Freemason and Illuminati symbols, further fueling theories of secret society's involvement. Another noteworthy point is the significant funding each location received from the government. The Greenbrier Bunker, of course, was a government project. Denver International Airport, meanwhile, received substantial federal funds for its construction, despite being a project that seemingly could have been handled at the state level. Some posit that once the Greenbrier bunker was exposed, a new, more covert facility was needed. Enter Denver International Airport. This theory suggests the possibility that the airport serves as the new protective fortress, this time not just for Congress, but potentially for a broader set of the government and possibly military elite. Could this be the case? Or are these merely coincidences in an ever-evolving world? As we navigate through these theories, it's crucial to approach them with an inquisitive mind, but also a generous dose of skepticism. For now, these remain intriguing conjectures, blending facts, assumptions and imaginative narratives into a fascinating puzzle. Finally, let's consider the size of Denver International Airport. It's notably the largest airport in the US by total land area, nearly twice the size of the next largest, Dallas-Fort Worth. This, combined with reports of large amounts of soil being moved during construction, has led some to speculate about what might be hidden under all that acreage. Could it be a modern version of the Greenbrier Bunker, built for a new era of concerns? Now we delve into the realm of evidence and debunking. For conspiracy theories to take hold, there must be a grain of truth, an element of mystery or anomaly. For both the Greenbrier Hotel and Denver International Airport, these elements certainly exist giving rise to myriad theories. In the case of the Greenbrier Hotel, the secret was real, a hidden bunker designed for congressional continuity in case of a nuclear attack. This was no mere speculation, but an actual physical fact. But its revelation in 1992 didn't inspire fears of an ongoing secretive operation. Rather, it confirmed a historical strategy from the Cold War era that was no longer relevant in the post-Soviet world, the Denver International Airport, however, continues to be a hub for conspiracy theories despite multiple attempts to debunk them. Many point to the eerie murals, strange symbols and capstone mentioning a New World Airport Commission as evidence of something sinister. However, airport officials and artists involved have offered explanations. 
The murals depict environmental destruction and restoration, not apocalypse. The symbols are Navajo language characters and references to the area's mining history, and the New World Airport Commission was simply a group of local business and political leaders aiming to bring a new world-class airport to Denver. And what of the supposed vast underground network? Airport officials acknowledge the existence of an automated luggage system that never worked as intended, leading to acres of unused tunnels. Today, we're taking a deep dive into a futuristic world of punishment, one that's only existed within the bounds of creative cinema until now. Imagine a world where prisons aren't just about bars, guards, and isolation cells. What if instead they existed on floating ships, within our dreams, or even on distant planets? In this exploration, we will delve into the thrilling yet ethically challenging concept of future prisons, inspired by cinematic masterpieces such as Escape Plan, Minority Report, Inception, and more. From the chilling isolation of a cryogenic cell to the boundless, intangible prison of the mind, we're going to unravel what the future of incarceration could look like. Alright, let's dive into the concept of floating prisons as depicted in the movie Escape Plan. The prison, known as the Tomb, is housed within an enormous ship, hidden from the world and ever on the move. It's a fascinating concept, isn't it? The idea that we could create a prison that is always shifting location, traversing international waters, making it not only a tough place to escape from, but also a hard place to locate. Imagine the mechanics of it. An advanced navigation system ensuring that the prison remains in international waters, away from jurisdictions, always on the move to deter escape plans. Prisoners wouldn't just need to worry about breaching walls or fences, but they would need to consider survival in open waters, contend with currents, and reckon with vast distances to any shore. It would be a prison escape turned survivalist expedition, daunting to say the least. Furthermore, the structure of the prison could be designed for rapid response, with sections that can be sealed off in case of a riot or an escape attempt. This kind of advanced section design would make it even harder for prisoners to navigate their way out, especially when paired with high-tech surveillance and security systems. But the questions this concept raises go beyond the logistical. What about the human rights of prisoners in such a facility? The psychological effects of confinement in a place constantly adrift? The challenges of regulation and oversight when the prison is not bound by the usual geographical and jurisdictional constraints? These would all need to be addressed. It is an intriguing thought experiment. Would a seaborn prison be the ultimate answer to escape-proof confinement? Or would it rather open a Pandora's box of legal, ethical, and humanitarian issues? Escape Plan presents a provocative vision of a possible future, but it is one that we would need to navigate with extreme care. So now let's take a look at the idea of a virtual prison, a concept depicted in the movie Minority Report. In this film, a sophisticated system known as pre-crime can predict crimes before they happen, and the so-called criminals are put into a dreamlike state for their sentence. But this isn't a pleasant dream. It's a psychological limbo that seems to stretch on endlessly. The technology used in the film, a neural interface, directly interacts with the prisoner's brain, creating a state of suspended animation while life outside continues. This virtual prison could, in theory, allow society to manage convicts without the need for physical prisons or resources. The individuals serving their sentences would be kept alive, but not conscious or capable of causing harm. But then, the ethics of this form of punishment become murkier the deeper you delve. Yes, it's efficient. But is it humane? Although the prisoners in Minority Report are not aware of the passing of time, they're trapped within their own minds in a state that is eerily close to a coma, is it right to put a person into such a state, essentially erasing their existence from the world for the duration of their sentence? Also, it opens the door for misuse of power. The entire justice system hinges on the assumption that the pre-crime predictions are accurate. But what if they're not? A person could be wrongfully imprisoned based on a crime they haven't committed yet. This concept brings forth a multitude of ethical and moral questions, Questions that society would need to answer before such a method could even be considered. Virtual prisons, as imagined in Minority Report, present a stark vision of a possible future, where justice is as much a product of our technological capabilities as it is a concept of moral right and wrong. From virtual prisons, we now dive into another concept that has captured the imagination of many science fiction enthusiasts, cryoprisons. 
The movie Demolition Man explores this futuristic idea. Picture this. Instead of serving time in a conventional prison, criminals are frozen for the duration of their sentence. Let's dive into that chilly prospect. The concept, in theory, seems almost elegant in its simplicity. Cryo-prisons would preserve the prisoner in a state of suspended animation. Their biological functions slow to an absolute crawl, placing them in a deep freeze. During this time, they neither age nor are they conscious, essentially placing them in a time-out from society until their sentence is complete. But how plausible is this, really? Cryogenics is an existing field of study, but its current applications are far from the science fiction world of Demolition Man. At this point in time, we are able to cryogenically preserve individual cells and small tissues, but a whole human being? That's a different story entirely. Current science can't successfully freeze and thaw a human without causing serious cellular damage, particularly from ice crystals that form and can puncture cells. But let's say, hypothetically in the future, we do overcome these hurdles. A new host of ethical considerations then come into play. If the frozen person is not conscious, are they serving a sentence or just waiting it out? What happens to their mind while their body is frozen? In Demolition Man, prisoners are subjected to subconscious rehabilitation programming to reform them. But would this be ethical? Could it even work? And then there's the social impact to consider. Releasing a prisoner who hasn't aged a day into a world that's moved on without them could be a recipe for societal disruption and personal disorientation. Cryoprisons, like the one shown in Demolition Man, are a fascinating thought experiment pushing the boundaries of our current understanding of both science and ethics in criminal justice. Digital prisons. If you're a fan of thought-provoking and often disturbing television, you might be familiar with Black Mirror. In one particularly memorable episode, White Christmas, the show introduces a concept of a digital prison that traps a copy of a person's consciousness, not their physical body. Digital prisons could work like this. A perfect copy of a prisoner's consciousness, known as a cookie in the show, is extracted and placed in a virtual prison environment. This simulation is controlled to the minutest detail, including the flow of time. This means that a prisoner could serve years, even centuries in this virtual hell, while only seconds pass in the real world. The concept on the surface is chillingly efficient. It seems like a way to completely neutralize threats without the costs and complications of physical incarceration. But when we dig deeper, things get complicated and ethically murky. For starters, the technology to create an exact copy of a person's consciousness doesn't currently exist. It's all purely speculative. Our understanding of consciousness and how it originates from the brain is still in its infancy. But for the sake of argument, let's imagine such a technology is developed. The implications are staggering and deeply troubling. Imagine being sentenced to hundreds of years of solitary confinement in mere moments. It's a psychological torture beyond what we can comprehend. In the Black Mirror episode, a prisoner is left alone in a cabin, isolated and tormented for what seems to him like thousands of years, while only a few seconds pass outside. It's a horrifying form of punishment, almost medieval in its cruelty, and raises serious questions about human rights and the principle of proportional punishment. And then there's the question of whether punishing a copy of a person's consciousness equates to punishing the person themselves. If the real person is free in the physical world, while their cookie suffers, who are we really punishing? Like many Black Mirror episodes, the concept of digital prisons poses unsettling questions about technology, punishment, and our sense of self. It forces us to grapple with what it means to be human in a world where our very consciousness might be replicated and manipulated. Diving into the realm of cosmic punishment, our next stop takes us into the far reaches of the galaxy. If you're a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you may be familiar with The Kiln from Guardians of the Galaxy. It's a high-security prison situated on a desolate planet, housing some of the universe's most dangerous criminals. The idea of off-planet incarceration is a fascinating one, so let's go ahead and see what it would entail. Imagine a prison not limited by earthly concerns, one where there's virtually unlimited room for expansion, and the security is provided by the inhospitable environment of outer space itself. Sounds like the perfect solution to crime, right? But just as we have seen with other concepts, the devil is in the details. First, 
The costs and logistical challenges of setting up and maintaining a prison in space are astronomical, quite literally. You'd need to transport prisoners there, provide life-sustaining resources like air and food, deal with waste management, and more. Currently, it costs around $10,000 to put a pound of anything into orbit. Sending a human, let alone thousands of them, plus all the necessary equipment and supplies to another planet, would be a colossal financial undertaking. Moreover, we must consider the isolation factor. A prison planet like the Kiln would be virtually impossible to escape from, but it would also be far removed from any chance of rehabilitation or reintegration into society. What happens when a sentence is over? How does one reintegrate into society when they've been light years away from it? Not to mention the psychological toll of being imprisoned on another planet, cut off from everything and everyone you know, could be incredibly damaging. The feeling of being removed from society can exacerbate feelings of hopelessness and desperation, leading to even more psychological problems. And just like with cryo-prisons, there's the ethical and human rights considerations. Is it humane to send a person to a prison planet, isolated and possibly doomed to live out their sentence in solitude or alongside the worst criminals in the galaxy? Like the other futuristic prison concepts, the idea of a prison planet challenges our assumptions about crime, punishment and human rights. It's a thought-provoking concept that opens the door to a universe of possibilities and potential nightmares. Continuing our journey through the landscapes of cinematic justice, let's now delve into a realm where the boundaries between reality and dreams are blurred, a prison of the mind. For this, we'll turn to Christopher Nolan's mind-bending masterpiece, Inception. In Inception, we explore the concept of dream-sharing technology, where individuals can infiltrate others' dreams and implant or steal ideas. Now imagine applying that technology to the prison system. Rather than physical bars and guards, the prisoner's mind itself becomes the confinement. They are trapped within their own dreams, their consciousness serving as both the prisoner and the jailer. One possible scenario could involve prisoners living in a dream state where they experience a normal, peaceful life. By contrast, they could also face an endless series of nightmares as part of their punishment. In either case, the prisoner's physical body would be in a state of suspended animation, perhaps even safely stored away. The advantage of this prison system would be the reduction of physical resources required to sustain prisoners, as well as the potential for rehabilitation. The dream state could be designed to teach prisoners empathy, social skills or other important life lessons, preparing them for eventual release. However, like all the other concepts we've discussed, this one is also riddled with ethical dilemmas and practical issues. If the prisoners are trapped within their dreams, how do we ensure they are receiving proper physical care? More importantly, what are the psychological implications of trapping a person within their mind? The concept of mental health is also crucial here. In a dream prison, an individual's psychological state becomes their reality. For someone with mental health issues, this could be a terrifying ordeal, exacerbating existing conditions or creating new ones. Furthermore, what would be the long-term effects on a person's psyche after living years or decades in a dream state? Would they be able to distinguish reality from the dream once released? And on a philosophical level, is it ethical to alter a person's reality to such an extent, even as a form of punishment? The concept of a prison of the mind takes the discussion of future incarceration methods into the realm of the abstract, pushing the boundaries of how we understand punishment, reality, and the human mind. And as always, thanks for watching.